For more than a hundred years, steam trains drove Britain. They carried freight from mines and quarries and people between cities, towns and villages. Then, after World War II, branch lines were closed and steam phased out. Some people refused to accept it. They joined together to rescue old steam engines and relay some of the redundant tracks. We had scythes and bill hooks, shovels and rakes, and uh, we just slashed at anything that, that was in the way. I had a couple of flatmates and they went up. And when they came back, they said, oh, it was awful. You had to say this hut <laughs> in the middle of nowhere under the mountains. And I thought, hut, mountains? Thought, yes, please. And some of these intrepid volunteers even filmed their exploits. I started taking films to record the disappearing scene that obviously if you didn't take a film of it, it wouldn't be there next week. As word of their work spread, they helped millions of people reconnect with a lost world that had once touched everyone's life. This is the story of how they did it, how this motley band of railway visionaries gave Britain its second golden age of steam. It's mid-July in Tawin, North Wales, home to the Talithlin Railway, the world's first railway owned and run by volunteers. Oh, there is your ticket. That's the adult and that's your two children. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. It's going to be busy, and a mile up the line at Pendry, the three engines rostered for the day are being prepared by some of those volunteers, including trainee firemen, Holly Parrot. It's the farmer's job to make sure the engine has enough coal and water and keep it clean. Get up early in the morning and we start by cleaning the engine from the previous day, removing all the dirt, all the grass seeds, all the old oil, making it nice and clean for our visitors for today and our passengers. During the week, Holly works in banking. Volunteering on the Talichin is her holiday could go abroad, but you just sit on the beach and do nothing. I'm achieving something, I'm learning, I'm having a great time with great people. It's the rawness of it, the back to basics. Although it's quite technical on how it works, it's been going for hundreds of years, uh, over 100 years, and it's still done on the same principle. And, it, yeah, British engineering at its best, really. They've got a life of their own. They're rather like an animal because you've got to do what they want you to do. You can't just go. Uh, she has a challenge every day. Charlie Daniel has been around a bit longer than Holly. I first came here, I think, in, in 1955 and started to work here then. And I've been here fairly regularly, you know, as ever since. And I was a fireman in 1958, when I was only just about 14. These days, there are hundreds of volunteers on the Tarachlin, but when Charlie first got involved, there were just a few. What fired their imagination was a passion to save something that they saw disappearing. The world of a narrow gauge steam railway. When we think of railways today, we think of the big passenger trains that run on tracks four feet, eight and a half inches apart. They're known as standard gauge. But the tracks on the Talachlin are less than half the width of the standard gauge. It's called a narrow gauge railway. There used to be narrow-gauge railways working in industries right across Britain. 
The Talachlin was built in the middle of the 19th century to serve one of the hundreds of slate quarries that once covered these remote hills in North Wales. The North Wales slate quarries basically put a roof on the world. It was an industry not of local proportions, but of global proportions. Each of them had internal railway systems, sprawling labyrinthine networks of narrow gauge railways, with scores of little engines and thousands of wagons at work, day and night, taking out the quarried slate. They each had a narrow gauge railway which ran to the local port where they, the slate was exported in ships. One or two steam enthusiasts managed to capture the vast scale of these quarries and their railways on film. We booked up first and had a guided tour. Uh, we made a mistake there because we later found out everybody else went over the fence and could stay there all day. We got rushed around the quarry by a guy who wanted to go home for his tea. So, so that was a bit of a disadvantage. We did have the advantage, though, that he took us places you wouldn't have been able to go, and we actually went up one of the long rope-worked inclines on a man-riding car, which was quite impressive. Right up the top, you could look down into the quarry where it was so deep, you could, uh, the people were just like little tiny pins. And you see these little tiny trains moving about. As well as slate, a few of these narrow gauge railways in North Wales carried passengers. The Talachlin was one of them. It was built to serve a small quarry called Brynglas. The line ran from a wharf at Tawen on the coast. It climbed for almost eight miles through delightful countryside that included a waterfall at Dolgoch. There was a passenger terminus at the village of Abergenolwyn, and the quarry was a mile further up the line. During the early years of the 20th century, output declined, and by the 1940s, there was hardly any slate being brought down at all. After the First World War, slate quarrying throughout Wales went into decline, serious decline in some cases. But the passenger services on the Talathlin Railway carried on. They served only a very thinly populated valley in small farming communities and what was left of the slate quarrying trade, which didn't add up to much. Both the line and Bringless Quarry had been bought by the local MP, Sir Henry Hayden Jones. When he finally closed the quarry in 1947, he kept the railway running. But with lack of investment, it quickly began to deteriorate. <laughs> then, Tom Rolt a man already well known for his campaign to rescue Britain's canals and an avid steam enthusiast, paid it a visit. One of the things that he found when he got to Wharf Station was a sign saying no trains today. So he wasn't able to, to, uh, to actually go up, the, go up the line by train. But he did something which he regarded as actually more useful for later purposes, which is that he actually ended up walking up the line. And he walked up the line and said that he'd never seen a, a, an apparently working railway in such appalling condition. It was more like walking up a country lane. And so he wrote a letter to the Birmingham Post and he said, there's this lovely little railway in Wales. It's held together on a shoestring and we are going to lose it. Does anybody else feel like helping out and saving it? A meeting was held at a hotel in Birmingham and it was packed out. And everybody turned up and said, yes, we would like to get involved in saving this little railway. 
Tom Rolt chose his venue well. North Wales was a popular holiday destination for people from the Birmingham area. The outcome of that meeting was momentous. Rolt and the others formed the Talechlin Railway Preservation Society with a committee of 15. When, in 1950, Sir Henry Hayden Jones died, they resolved with his widow to save the Talechlin. For the first time anywhere in the world, a band of volunteers planned to run a passenger railway. Tom Rolt's view of the Talech Lynn was shaped by what was happening in post-war Britain. In 1948, the Labour government had nationalised the railways and Rolt saw the Talech Lynn as an alternative to what he believed to be increasing state control. There was this idea, in a way, that this was a small enclave from which to perhaps build and defend um, and take on this grey, uniform, state-driven world outside. Most of the people involved came from very much from middle-class professional backgrounds. I think one could um, call them probably highly conservative people in many ways. They were very much people who disapproved, I think, of nationalisation of railways. They saw this as produ producing a sort of grey uniformity. And I think they disapproved of much of the post-war world, nationalisation, the welfare state, greater equality. Um, although much later on the Talithin Railway was described as a workers' cooperative, uh, these were extremely um, conservative workers, um, to put it mildly. Whatever their politics, they planned to open the railway in spring 1951. But they were desperately short of hands-on volunteers. One of the first to respond was a 22-year-old civil engineer, John Bate. I had a week's holiday spare because uh, I was working up at Sellafield, a nuclear plant, and they had a shutdown week, so I had to go somewhere and came here. And I enjoyed myself so much and I found that there was so much that needed doing and so few people with any engineering knowledge that um, I became part of the furniture, as it were. John first came here in July 1951 and he's been here off and on ever since, including 31 years as chief engineer. Right from the beginning, he kept a diary of his work. Tell us, Lynn, diary of week. 28.751, Saturday, met Mr. Rolt. Started work with Maguire and Jeff. Replaced two sleepers 200 yards north of Tawin Pendry Station. Worked 2 to 5.30 p.m. It's all there. <laughs> Monday, water spirit level. <laughs> they hadn't got a level. The track was all over the place. The track might have been all over the place, but it didn't stop the volunteers from opening the world's first preserved railway on schedule on May the 14th, 1951. The track was buried in the grass. There were sleepers here and there, uh, but it really it was the turf that kept the rails in place and um, the joints were terrible. Some rails were completely free at the joints and could wander up and down. The carriages were not too bad, but uh, the only locomotive was Dolgoch, and it was in, say, an advanced state of disrepair. When the inspector looked at the railway in 1952, he said, well, if it wasn't open, I wouldn't allow it to open, but as it's still running, um, I suppose it had better carry on. It was in such an appalling condition. When David Mitchell joined as a volunteer in the 1950s, he was just 14 years old. First of all, they tended to come on to working parties, which were mainly in winter. And at Easter, particularly, we would spend our time digging ballast in the quarry. Then we'd come down after school on Friday night 
I don't quite remember when I did my homework. <laughs> Probably didn't. In 1953, a serious amateur filmmaker, an American called Carson Davison, turned up and wanted to make a film of the Talaflin Railway. It's a remarkable record of the railway as it was in 1953. He was on one train and uh, where the loco actually derailed. After all those years of Welsh weather, cross ties decay, spikes get looser, rails spread dangerously, finally a wheel jumps the tracks, and then... It's the only bit of the film that isn't properly exposed because he was obviously just looking out when it happened and grabbed the camera and took it. Derailed. A long, exhilarating mountain walk ahead. The gauge is supposed to be two feet three inches. When it isn't, there's almost always trouble. He was wandering around shooting, and uh, if he saw something interesting, he shot it. <laughs> Perhaps much as you're doing now. <laughs> oh, I appeared in it one or two places, doing some wagon repairs. That's John controlling the points. They were putting wheels under some open carriage bodies that had come from the Penryn Quarry Railway. John is seen there taking the axle boxes off a slate wagon. And again, a lovely bit of phraseology. They also serve who only stand and bash things with a sledgehammer. It's just charming. I, don't, I can't think of a better word to sum it up. It's something that shows the early days of railway preservation, the enthusiasm there. This, then, is the Tally Lynn Railway and its Preservation Society. Men who have found a challenge and take a special sort of joy in answering it. They found a railway which was crumbling slowly into dust and made it come alive again. And it may just be that another generation will thank them for preserving the Tally Lynn. People did thank them and turned up in droves. What the new railway offered was the opportunity for those with modest means to get really involved with steam. The only place to do that before 1951 had been the garden if you were very rich or in a club. Max Sinclair was typical. He got his fix of steam by being secretary of his local model engineers society. In the 1950s, most cities had a model railway club open to anyone who could afford the modest membership fee. People would take along engines they had built or just go to the open days for the thrill of a ride on a miniature steam engine. In 1955, Max filmed the opening of his club in Diglis Park in Worcester. Having completed the, the construction, we decided to have an open day and we invited the mayor, Rosa Ratcliffe, to come along. She was a jolly sort and uh, we all, she made the, all the little speeches and the next thing she, she lifted her leg and jumped on the train. We were amazed, so we, we took her round the track. Well, I think from childhood I'd been a, a railway nutter. I think it must be the thing that switches on all steam enthusiasts. So you, t you take an inert thing like water and you, and you make a train go at 120 miles an hour. Max's chance to get involved with bigger railways began with a visit to another steam and home movie enthusiast his GP, Brian Rogers. I went to see him because I had some problems with my wrist and uh, he said, what are, you, what are you doing next weekend? 
Uh, I said, well, I'm putting a model railway around my garden. He, he said, oh, no, you're not. You're, you're coming to Festiniog with us. The Festiniog Railway in the mountains of Snowdonia in North Wales was 40 miles north of the Talith Lynn. It was the world's first narrow gauge steam railway. It ran for 22 miles from the harbour at Porth Maddock, climbing 700 feet to the town of Blaenau Festiniog. Like the Talith Lynn, it carried passengers as well as slate, but numbers fell in the 30s. Passenger traffic ended in 1939, and after a long and slow decline, the railway closed in 1946. For almost eight years, nothing much happened, until volunteers reopened it in 1954. Max and Dr Rogers were amongst the first enthusiasts. They found the railway abandoned. They left their tools, their, their overalls, everything hanging up in the workshops, the job they were working on, locomotives stored outside in the rain. And then, of course, the, the growth started, brambles, grass, and it, it was a, an invisible green railway when we started. Their films and photographs captured the state of dereliction on the line and the spirit of the voluntary effort. That was um, our first World War locomotive called a Simplex. They were used in the trenches for moving ammunition. Of course, at the end of the war, most of them were scrapped, but uh, one or two survived, and uh, we managed to acquire one for the railway. And it, it was um, able to play an important job before we could get steam engines working. We were a work party there, getting the station into some sort of order. We planned to sleep inside the ticket office and waiting room, but uh, when we lit the fire in there, the um, moisture started coming out of the walls and uh, soon it was like a thick fog. And Mrs Jones and Mr Jones, the station master who had been there, they were still living in the house. They came round to see us and were absolutely horrified. They, they said, no way can you sleep in there. You come through and uh, sleep in our lounge which we did, and we all curled up in our sleeping bags in rows like, like sardines. The basic living appealed to volunteers of all ages. I read an article in a rowing magazine saying they needed volunteers, and with two other school friends, uh, we were by then 14, we decided to come and work on the railway, and we came up to Wales for two weeks and worked on the railway, and I've been hooked on this railway ever since. It seemed just like the Talith Lynn, a derelict, decrepit railway and a band of volunteers ready to bring it back to life. But there were differences. Well, the Festiniog had a very different sort of structure from the Talith Lynn, uh, primarily because there was a Festiniog Railway Company and a society which, can, which involved voluntary enthusiasts. And there was a fair amount of conflict between those running the company who would issue orders from a distance and some of the volunteers. In 1955, Alan Garraway became the full-time paid manager employed by the company. That's Alan, driving the Simplex. My father was a railwayman at Cambridge and I used to go around with, with Dad with he to the various depots that he was in charge of and I had got this in my blood and it, it just grew with me. Alan had been a professional railwayman in the army and on British Rail. He had a very distinct perspective. He did not approve of rail enthusiasts. He said we are enthusiastic railwaymen, not rail enthusiasts. He ran a tight ship and expected those who were involved to get on and work and uh, wasn't interested in time wasters. So he said to us as 14 year olds, be here at nine o'clock in the morning and uh, you know, 
and that's what he expected. If we were late, he basically said, don't bother to come. I think uh, people used to think me a bit of a, a hard taskmaster. And I, I was, because I, I believed that if a job was got to be done, it had got to be done properly. And I wasn't going to have people coming along and uh, running my engines and uh, just any old how. We started off in 1955 with Prince, two coaches, running a shuttle service across the Cobb at Port Maddock. Then in 1956, we got it running to two miles to Minforth. In 1957, we got three miles to Penryn. It got more and more successful. We had queues out of the booking office at Port Maddock every, every afternoon. And this was our greatest trouble, was to, was to carry the people who wanted to travel on the railway. It was the same story here on the Talich Lynn, and in the summer of 1957, the trouble was about to get worse. The BBC turned up. That's the first time I've ever had to fish for a microphone, but surely this is the right place to do it, alongside a lovely Welsh trout stream, which comes tumbling down this gorge of Dol Gorch, right in the very heart of the Welsh mountains. The corporation sent an outside broadcast unit and two of its biggest presenters, Hugh Weldon and Winford Vaughan Thomas, to present a programme live from the railway. And above us, the mountains. The technology of the time, of course, was very primitive. The, re the film in places isn't very good because obviously the reception uh, came and went. But 1957 must have been quite early for outside broadcasts, particularly from somewhere in mid Wales. But luckily, one of the members made a high-quality colour film of the making of the outside broadcast. And there's one lovely bit where they'd taken the glass out of the spectacle plate of number four, so Lord Northesk, who was president, could sort of hold on with his hand through the, where the glass would be in order to be interviewed, looking backwards, by Hugh Weldon. Yes, well, uh, Tell me, are you always fireman on this engine? No, I share the job with about six or seven other members who've been passed as fireman. You're a, you're a qualified fireman? Yes, yeah, we're a qualified fireman. We've oh. learned the job. There is a sequence where they've got all these sheep at Abergenolwyn, which are clearly out of control. Lord North S, could I have a word with you down here? <laughs> Just come and join us a minute. There we are. i tell you one thing I wanted to ask you very much indeed. In a way, you know sheep are all over the place. In a way, it's a little rather impertinent, perhaps. What I want to know is how, how can you keep a society of this sort going when the, 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 the basis must really be, must be, that everybody wants, wants to be an engine driver? There's really a job for everyone on this little line. They have something. The technology might not have been great, and the sheep and their mind is a distraction, but the programme itself did wonders for the Tadaklin. After the programme, our traffic virtually doubled overnight, and panic. I was phoned up at work down in the London area by our engineering director, Bill Faulkner, and uh, he said, we must build some more carriages quickly, what can you do? So I sat down there and then I sketched out a design in the office, went back to the digs in the evening and made a proper drawing, sent it to Bill next day with a list of materials. <laughs> and about three weeks later, the materials arrived and we started building it right there on the pit. While carriages were relatively easy to build, finding steam engines to pull them was a major headache. <laughs> As the popularity of both the Talich Lynn and the Festiniog grew, so did their need for more engines. Up until the 1940s, industrial Britain had been awash with them. Passenger trains ferried people about the country, but narrow-gauge railways drove industry. They had been everywhere. It was the most cost-effective and indeed the only way of moving bulk loads of raw materials. 
they could go around hills, over mountains, um, through valleys and could be built fairly cheaply and fairly effectively in a short space of time. Serving quarries, collieries, small factories and taking produce down to the nearest port of conveyance. In the English Midlands they had been prolific, helping dig out huge amounts of ironstone for the steel industry. These little narrow gauge steam engines, they were the lifeblood, they were the beating heart of the ironstone industry. Without that, you would not have been able to expand the quarries to the level of production, which provided the income for huge towns like Corby or Kettering. We went to the Kettering Ironstone Furnace Railway. It was a filthy day, pouring with rain. Uh, but you got these trains appearing out of the mist. There were two big engines working the main trains and a little tiny black hawthorn saddle tank without a cab working the shunt in and the chap on it got a mac on and he was getting drenched. And he told us that uh, none of them had cabs on originally, but they, that the company decided that the staff deserved protection and they put cabs on. But the man who drove the little shunting engine at that time was a big he-man and wasn't having a sissy cab on his locomotive. And he said the rest of us have cursed him ever since. But we filmed a train coming in from the iron ore fields. They had a steelworks there in the old days, but as the industry declined, the steelworks had been demolished and removed, and they just got tipplers where they tipped the iron ore into British railway wagons to go off to places like Scunthorpe. Then, in the 1950s, after almost a hundred years working at the heart of industry, steam began to disappear. As roads got better and lorries became bigger and more efficient, narrow gauge railways were phased out. Britain was modernising. Factories, quarries, collieries and other industrial concerns that had private internal railway systems were closing them down because they found that road transport provided a more cost-effective alternative. As a result, Thousands of locomotives, wagons and rolling stock became redundant. Most were cut up or scrapped. They might have gone forever, but for the efforts of two steam enthusiasts who in the early 1960s championed the cause of narrow gauge. One was a rector from a parish in Leicestershire. The other was one of the Fastiniog volunteers, Max Sinclair. I didn't like to see anything being destroyed. And I felt that if somebody designed and built a, a beautiful locomotive, I don't think we have a right to just chop it up. And so when the opportunity came to, to save a railway engine, uh, I went wholeheartedly into the project. His opportunity came in February 1959. I found this uh, little Kerr Stewart on a farm not very far from here. So one Sunday morning I went out and uh, found the farmer, Mr Beard, and asked him about his engine and he said, oh, we've got one somewhere, but it's, um, it's under that pile of older apple trees we've grubbed up. I went round and couldn't believe it. There was a, a mountain of timber. Eventually we found Brockerman with its um, funnel off and the water tank off but we could see that it was, it was a restorable engine. And he said, well, if you promise to restore it and not break it up, you can have it. It was a Kerr Stewart Wren, and um, with a friend we started restoring it. Trying to restore it, we found we, we hadn't any spares. Max needed to research railway archives. Going through the, the railway books, we found people who got Kerr Stewart locos, industrial companies, and uh, my wife and I would write to these people uh, saying we were looking for spares for our engine, 
And the responses came back, well, we haven't got many spares, but we've got three locomotives. Discovering Brockerman set Max off on a quest that led him to restoring no less than 13 narrow-gauge engines, all of which he gave away. One of the first he came across was another Kerr Stewart engine rusting away in a quarry in Devon. It was called Peter Pan. These days, it's kept at the narrow gauge railway in Leighton Buzzard by its current owner, Graham Morris. It was built 1922. They built a lot of these, nearly 170 of them. Um, that was unusual because in those days, people used to go to a railway engine manufacturer and order an engine. They were largely built specially, one-offs. These were built in bulk for stock. It was also very small. It was only about four tonnes. And that was specifically to run on temporary railways. Max, he saved lots of these little engines. And, and he never intended really any credit for it. And he didn't intend to keep any. In fact, he didn't keep any. All he wanted to do was to stop the scrap man getting them. And having done so, he'd then write letters uh, to people he thought might like the engines to try and find good homes for them. Max Sinclair might not have expected any credit for saving so many engines, but Graham had other ideas. In 2009, together with others from Leighton Buzzard, he presented a painting done by the renowned railway artist Jonathan Clay to Max. It depicted seven of the 13 engines he had rescued. There weren't many people in those days doing this sort of thing. It was a very rare. It, it, times were changing fast. People just wanted to get rid of all the old stuff. Nobody recognised its importance. There were other folk, but there weren't many. One of the few who did recognise the importance of steam and the need to spread the gospel of narrow-gauge engines was a home movie enthusiast and rector of Cadeby, a small parish in Leicestershire, the Reverend Teddy Boston. He was plump, jolly, not your idea of a clergyman at all. He was born in Solihull, and he had a, a model railway in his bedroom that went up to the ceiling, uh, you know, up and down again, uh, because his family were all into horses, and uh, this was complete opposite to horses. And, um, and then they moved to Cambridge, and he went to Cambridge University, to Jesus College Cambridge, and he formed the railway group there, and he had a model railway in his own garden, and so he pursued... Um, railways and steam whenever he could. By the time Teddy Boston died in 1986, his model railway had grown to be one of the biggest in the country. Today, it's looked after by two of his friends, Brian Gillespie and Peter Vernon. OK, send me your fruit next, Brian, then, can you, please? Brian remembers the moment in 1962 when the Reverend Boston moved on from model railways to rescue a narrow-gauge steam engine called Pixie. Pixie is an 040 Bagnall, built in 1919 for the War Department to go to the trenches, but peace was declared and it never went. It ended up at one of the iron ore companies at Cranford and then... Teddy used to see it on various visits to his parents at Cambridge. As in most of Britain's mines and quarries, steam was being phased out. Pixie was standing idle. And he went and sort of knocked on the door, is Pixie for sale? And when they realised they wanted it to run it, not to scrap it, they said, you can have it. Teddy's plan was to run the engine round rails he would have to lay in the three-quarter acre garden, the rectory garden. To buy a narrow gauge locomotive and put it in your garden was sort of unheard of. And then we started laying track, which half a day with 
a Jack Jim Crow, which is the item used to bend rail, and a packing shovel, which make, pushes the ballast under the sleepers. You learn far more in that than reading all the manuals. But he says, let's see if we can get steam up. So we just lit the fire and, and then it was, anybody want a ride? And that was the start of the KB Light Railway. Brian was there from the outset. The railway opened to the public in 1963 and people flocked to it. We used to run the train till about five, half past five. Mm -hmm. Then we'd put Pixie away, eat fish and chips, and then we would have a film show, <laughs> one of Teddy's film shows, which would go on till about one, two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I think the proximity of the graveyard always added a bit of atmosphere to KB. Some yes. people didn't like it, but on a foggy night, it was always pretty good <laughs> around there. And one night, they'd dug an open grave ready for um, somebody to be buried. And I was back in my car out the drive in the fog, and as the lights came around, it suddenly picked up somebody climbing out the grave. It was actually the church warden who just put a ladder in there to check it was OK and got water in it, you know, for the <laughs> I wish I'd had a camera there. Yes. With help from lots of volunteers like Peter, Brian and Audrey, Teddy opened the rectory to the public every month. The Cadeby Light Railway drew thousands of people into the world of narrow gauge. Alongside Pixie, Teddy had other steam locomotives, a miniature railway, a steam roller, and a traction engine. And after May 1974, a wife. Well, the wedding was a day to remember for everyone, not only for the bride and groom. The day began with a steam-driven lorry ferrying the bride to be to the ceremony. Admission to the church was by ticket only, and it was relayed outside by loudspeakers because there were so many people couldn't get them all in. Came out of church and all, all these hundreds of people were there and uh, photographs, etc. But we didn't realise that all the steam boys had been working, beavering away while we were in church and we walked through an archway of shovels. Crowds cheered the bride and groom as they left the church in a steam cavalcade that included Teddy's own traction engine and steam road roller. The day ended with a party a real Boston tea party in the village hall. Teddy actually wore shoes for the first time in his life then, I think, because he, he was always in sandals. When he died and he was buried, I had the shoes put in, uh, asked the undertaker to put the shoes in the coffin because I wanted him to arrive duly shod. Audrey carried on the work of spreading Teddy's message long after he died. Today, Pixie no longer runs round the rectory. She's being restored. Meanwhile, she and Teddy are commemorated in the Cadeby village sign. Well, Audrey contacted me to say that the sign needs a little bit of TLC and uh, it had been up for 12 years. Um, but it's it's cleaned up quite nicely, but um, as you see, basically this is all uh, relief carved. Uh, we glue together planks of oak, so as you can see, it's got a little bit of depth to it. So even if a hundred years' time this paint had all gone, hopefully the carving would still be there. One, two, three. Okay. Then, uh... The sign that Audrey commissioned does more than just commemorate Teddy's contribution to steam preservation. It also captures the place that steam still has in many people's hearts. I think people have always loved steam engines. 
And when they began to disappear off the railways with the dieselisation of the late 50s and 60s, people started to think, hang on, we love these, we don't want to see them go. They were like living, breathing creatures. They took people to work, they took them to the seaside, they took people on days out before people could afford to buy a car. They were part of an age in which people grew up and people identified with it, and they wanted to keep a little part of that. The place where people could really identify with steam was North Wales, where preservation was going from strength to strength. By 1965, volunteers on the Festiniog had managed to restore more than 10 miles of track and were halfway to their destination. Now, they faced a huge barrier. The problem was that while the line had been derelict, the electric authority came he built a reservoir across the tracks at Tanagrisha, which blocked the line. And the reason this was a big problem was that the railway originally had a, a gradient between Festiniog and Tanibol. And this reservoir was higher than the railway. And the company didn't want to steepen the line because if they steepened the line, the engines couldn't pull the same trains. So to solve that problem, uh, we did some surveys and came up with the idea that you could build a loop. By building a loop, a spiral, it was possible to increase the length of the line and maintain the gradient, go round the lake and tie back into the original line. And so that was the project that was eventually adopted and it became known as the deviation. Gerald Fox was a volunteer at the time. This model shows the problem and solution he came up with. Trains heading for Blynau Festiniog began on the old line on the left of the model, but would deviate to the right to go round in a big loop. It would make the line longer, but the gradient or slope would be more gentle and therefore easier for trains to climb. The only problem they had was actually building it, the deviation would be a huge engineering task, including a cutting, an embankment, a bridge, and finally a tunnel through solid granite. It was something that had never before been attempted by volunteers anywhere. Inevitably, not everyone on the railway was happy about the plan. They were a bit awkward at times because they had no idea and they didn't interact with the railway very well. And that was the trouble. They had to come into Tunnable Station with their wagons and one thing or another. And there, were, there was friction. So we agreed that if the project was going to go ahead, we would recruit labour from outside the established source of volunteers. So what we sought were digging enthusiasts, people who wanted a weekend in Wales, doing something physical, uh, that they would get them out of their offices, and we set up a rotor. The big problem was, why do people stay? How do you live up here? How can we make this work? And I was walking down the line one day and came past uh, Thialt Manor, and there was this guy outside, so I went to talk to him. And he turned out to be a retired colonel from the British Army. And he said, well, uh, you can have my cow shed. And um, he became a, a strong, enthusiastic supporter of the project, and actually a, a vital component, because he had an explosives license. And, and to dig rock, you have to blast it. We built a siding for him so that he could keep his locomotive up there. And uh, that allowed him to go down to Tannibal, where his car was kept, uh, and move his furniture and whatever, instead of carrying it up the hill.
Gerald and other deviationists, still old friends, are returning to celebrate a birthday. I had a couple of flatmates who went up, and when they came back, they said, oh, it was awful. You had to stay in this hut <laughs> in the middle of nowhere under the mountains. And I thought, hut, mountains? Thought, yes, please, you know, and I, you know, so I volunteered next to go up, and I, I really loved it. It was like a second home. There was Bristol Group, and that's the one I came up with because I was living in Bristol at the time. And there was a Northern Group. Um, and that's the one I was involved yeah. in. Two, Two London, London groups, groups yes. London A, London B. It was a, a very mixed bag of people that mm. you had. With people of different professions. And yes. I, I was a teacher at the time. I was training to be a chef. I was at college. We had a mixed male and female workforce probably over the project about 30% of the workforce was female and therefore you worked as a group, you ate as a group, you slept as a group and uh, there was basically an unwritten rule that there was no hanky-panky. I just finished with a boyfriend, I was a bit at a loose end and my friend Ian that I was at college with said why don't you and Karen come on this working party on the deviation because he'd been involved in it for a number of years he was a railway enthusiast and we said well we've nothing else to do you know we'll we'll go and have a a bit of fun and this guy turned up with a car to give us a lift and it was david that's david on the left he was organizing volunteer working groups at the time just as we were leaving to go out to the car, my friend Karen said to me, oh, I like that guy with the big fancy sweater and the brown eyes. And I went, well, you can keep your eyes off him because I'm having him. <laughs> I, I just happened to have a camera and um, this is the only film I've ever made with it. I've been an engineer all my life, ever since I was 15. My job at the time, as far as the railway was concerned, was to organise the Northern Group. We have here pictures of the barn site cutting and the Rosslyn Bridge. These are taken around about 1969. The, the idea of, of digging out the cuttings was to break the rock into manageable pieces and load them into skip wagons. These were then pushed or gravitated down to the end of the embankment uh, and then tipped over the end. Occasionally the wagon went with it especially if it had been frozen overnight. The, the wagon was loaded with probably a tonne, tonne and a quarter of broken rock and was quite difficult to, to manhandle. You had to sort of stand on the chassis. Yes. And you... one of you would release the, the sort of braking mechanism and then you'd push it. And, and the risk was sometimes you felt the thing could overbalance and go down, down with the rocks. My we friend Karen them. and I, we were, we were on the, the site, just the other side of the trees here, and there was about a three foot diameter tree that needed to come down. So the pair of us between us got the axe out and started to chop it and chop it and chop it. And the men kept saying, would you like a hand with that? And we were saying, no, it's our tree and we'll bring it down. And the sense of achievement was absolutely incredible, you know. But it wasn't all work. I do remember people skin, skinny dipping in the uh, lake. Do you, yes. do you remember that? I can remember it. I never actually did it myself, no, no but my husband has done it, evidently. <laughs> yes. But the fun part of the weekend was going home on the Sunday evening because we used to yes. pack this flat wagon Absolutely. with all the rucksacks and boxes and things and yeah. used to sit on it. And all there was between you and eternity was a break. Yeah. And you just had to hope that... And you, you know, whistled at all the places it said whistle. That's right, You'd whistle. Yes. And we just and we went to go down down really, here. really fast down the line, yeah. all weathers. And I can remember one lad, brilliant. lad sat Loved on a rucksack it. and he must have overbalanced and he fell down the embankment by Campbell's platform and we had to slam the brake on quickly to go and retrieve him. The volunteers were entitled to their fun. They had been working on the deviation since 1965. Now, ten years in, they were about to confront their greatest obstacle. A solid wall of granite they'd have to tunnel. Well, we're faced with this beautiful cutting we're in at the moment and uh, a blank rock face and uh, 271 metres of granite to get through. 
Work on the tunnel started in September 1975, and for the next two years, hundreds of volunteers turned out every weekend. Luckily, the project manager, Bob Lamarchand, and his colleagues, Pete Hughes and Robin Daniel, knew what they were doing. They were mining engineers. We drill uh, about 40, 45 holes, eight foot long. Uh, that might take as much as three or four hours. Fill the majority of them up with explosives, and then uh, that's blasted at the end of the day. And uh, when you come back next morning, you've got about 50 tonnes of broken rock ahead of you. And you've got about uh, maybe four or five or six hours of loading rock um, before you can then start the drilling process all over again. And it wasn't just the railway that benefited from their presence. When the miners came to do the tunnel, then Robin walked into my life and uh, I thought, oh, wow, <laughs> big bearded guy, you know. Yes, he was. Uh, did you a lovely me? sense of humour. Um, and I started falling for him. And then, uh, yeah, we gradually got together. Then. But I was volunteering at the time. I used to polish his... Uh, I used to sharpen up his drill steels. I was... <laughs> <laughs> Sue's drill sharpening skills were clearly effective. Robin and the others completed the tunnel in the summer of 1977. Five years later, volunteers drove the first train into Blaenau Festiniog, 150 years after the horse-drawn line had opened. We met up with the miners, the other two guys the other day, and we were saying amongst ourselves all the exciting things we've done in life. This is the most worthwhile, the most interesting thing that we've done, and we're all very proud of what we've done. What they achieved was truly remarkable. This disparate band of volunteers in Wales launched a movement that has spread throughout the world. And the story of narrow gauge preservation isn't finished. Even today, small railways are opening in different parts of the country and on the Talithlin, the place where in 1951 it all began, Volunteers are at work, still laying new track. Back for the last bit. The narrow gauge preservation movement just rolls on and on. In the next programme, the story of how volunteers took on the massive challenge of restoring Britain's standard gauge railways. What you see with the station name board is a group of us putting it back in its rightful place. That was, if you like, reclaiming the railway for us. And how one of Britain's most popular films changed railway preservation forever. This is actually the spot where I stood to uh, flag off the train in several sequences in the 1970 film.